17 of this podcast. No, I'm kidding. Welcome everyone to podcast uh, three. I'm joined by Chris again. Thank you, Chris. And today we're going to talk through left ventricular ejection fraction. So as you can imagine, it's a huge topic. We're going to try and break it down, talk about some of the things we love, some of the things we don't love so much. And yeah, we'll go from there, see how we go. Yeah, I don't know about you, but when I was learning echo initially, Ejection fraction was always the, the thing. Grail. It was always a holy grail. It was <laughs> yeah. always a thing that I, I read in reports and it's the only thing anyone spoke about. And it's a thing that I wanted to be able to do. And I guess it's one of those things about meeting your heroes. You should never do it. You know, the, the moment <laughs> I learned how to do it, I realized that it just isn't, isn't anything that I thought it was and probably isn't quite how people use it, particularly in our setting. Um, so that's my two cents on it. Should we talk about how to do it first? Because I, I think, think so. let's just start with that. Yeah. So we're going to be doing the Simpsons biplane ejection yes, fraction, yes. right? Yep. So we have a video here, and it's a slightly long video, So, and it's not perfect by any means. Not perfect by any means. But um, Emma, do you want to just talk through what... What Louise is what doing we have here. here. Yeah, so we have a an apical four chamber and it's actually a zoomed, so it's a focused left ventricular view in the four chamber. And Louise, one of our incredible sonographers, this is obviously a difficult patient, is tracing the, the endocardial border. Now it's really important this part and, and this is this I think shows beautifully why we need to have caution when we're doing it. Mm. Because it's really hard to delineate that that endocard you know, the, the border between your the blood endocardial interface the yeah. tissue blood interface um, and it's important that you include the pap muscles and any trabeculae um, you know within they're all part of the lv cavity so mm. that's really important to include them in your tracing yeah. um, so louise has traced that out in, in the four chamber in diastole uh, to get a volume um, and the the uh, now she's doing the same in systole so again tracing as best she can um, that tissue blood interface and what she will do is that the machine works it out for you. It's, it's um, it, it has these a method of discs essentially. So you have all these, of these discs, and they have obviously each have a, an area and a, and a height, and they work out the volume of each of the discs. So you know the machine plugs it into a, a mathematical equation, which does does use some geometrical assumptions about mm -hmm. the shape of the left ventricle, um, which is why it's not one of the other reasons it's not perfect. But um, it, yes, it'll essentially it'll give you a volume um, in from the apical four chamber, yep. and then you want an orthogonal plane to the apical four, which is your apical two. And again, Louise will trace the volumes out in diastole and systole, and then the machine will put that together to give you a biplane volume, which is Simpson's biplane. Yeah, it will do the same thing with the with the disc volume calculation. Now, the really key thing about the orthogonal planes is that they they need to be orthogonal. And that's one of the really tricky things. So one way to a little tip and trick of knowing whether you are in an orthogonal plane, obviously, if you're not using biplane, a 3D probe where you can actually biplane your four chamber, then you're going to need to do that manually. Um, and one way to do that is making sh and is looking at the lengths that you're getting and diastole and your yeah. four chamber and your two chamber and making sure those lengths are within 10% of each other. And that's probably reasonable en enough. Um, you know, according to the guidelines that you've got, um, you know, good enough or orthogonal, you're not too foreshortened. But foreshortening, poor endocardial border definition um, are, are some of the main reasons why we do need to take uh, often these values with a pinch of salt. So what, what we can see here, Chris, is the values that it generates for us. Yeah. So it's take already taken into consideration what Louise has done in the four mm. chamber. Um, and it's giving us an end diastolic volume um, method of discs biplane that's what that stands for yeah. and it gives us a left ventricular end systolic method of disc biplane and then it's just going to use the difference between those to give us a stroke volume over the end diastolic volume mm -hmm. which is our ejection fraction and so that would be 120 minus 53 over 120 and yeah. that gives us an ejection fraction using simpson's biplane of 55 yeah so that's so that's how it would be done and using echo to measure volumes often underestimates the volume if you're comparing it to MRI. I suppose I see it as a stepwise thing. You've got cardiac MRI, gold standard, and then probably 3D volumes, although slightly less validated, but more data emerging um, better. And then and then TTE with contrast and then TTE, you know, without contrast. Um, but it's pretty good. And it's yeah. and it's certainly got prognostic uh, data associated with it. Definitely, definitely. And... Uh, 
but for the ICU population, I mean, this can be super hard, can't it? And yes. you know, we're trying to get a four chamber view without foreshortening it, getting good enough endocardial definition, let alone trying to get that anterior wall into your two chamber, it can be really challenging. So um, a lot of the time we're not doing this or with a lot of our patients, if we don't have good enough image quality, then you need to be able to recognise that it's not good enough image quality to do that by plane. And obviously at Nepean, we're doing a lot of outpatient stuff as well. Yeah. And we really do need to be as accurate as possible with trending, you know, uh, ejection fractions, particularly in those that have got valvular disease where it absolutely is prognostic and it can help guide management. Yeah, so and, in and it's far more validated in the outpatient population, isn't it? They have a yeah. steady state. Their loading conditions are consistent. Exactly. They've got far more predictable physiology and um, a lot of outpatient cardiology therapies are based on ejection fraction. So in that population, it's essential and we really need to be doing as good a job to get an, an accurate trend as we can do. Um, but it's a little bit trickier in our population. It's a lot, a lot harder. What, what I would say about ejection fraction is that we should try if we can to get to get a Simpsons. Um, but you know, if uh, and, and definitely in the outpatient population for the reasons I mentioned, and if you can't see you know, more than two contiguous segments of the LV, yeah. then as per the, the guidelines, we should be considering contrast in this in this patient group. Yeah. Um, yes, and, and just to mention as well that in, in our patient group, it prob if you can't get a good Simpsons, then, you know, don't report it, don't use it. If you know it's not a good number, do not use it. And, and probably we know from, you know, a few studies that the eyeball technique of relatively experienced people That's is probably is probably, you know, better to use rather than use a terrible yeah. Simpsons number. We can probably extend that out to all echo, really, can't we? I mean, yeah. you just shouldn't overcall things because 100%. you can really run into trouble if that's what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned using contrast. I'm sure most ICUs don't have access to that. Um, but for people who maybe it, it might be something we more uh, will get access to in the future. So um, we've got actually got some images of, of a contrast scan. Um, I think this is one of yours, isn't it? So yeah, we it just is. Yeah, go I just a, I guess a poor man's contrast. Like <laughs> if you haven't got access to to contrast, is perhaps just to play around with the B color mode mapping, because sometimes ch changing it to gold or you know pink, you like the pink one. Um, yeah, that was very I like sexist the orange. of me. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I like the orange one. The, the chroma, the orange the, chroma one oh, on Philips. I've not, I've not seen yeah, that one. Yeah, it's quite good. Okay. I quite like sepia. I did go through a phase of the pink, but then came out of that one. Um, anyway, that's sometimes good to, to try to see whether you can just make that endocardial border definition yeah. pop. Yeah. Um, so this and, was... And the walls, the, the you know, differentiating between trabeculations and the septal walls. Yes. It's another thing that's quite nice. So definitely yes. try and play around with the with the different colours. We were a bit worried about their left ventricular systolic function there. Um, but you can see this is the four chamber and I couldn't see this antralateral wall very well Chris or the the apex really yeah. and as just as you were saying often the the hardest wall to, to to view is the is the anterior wall in the two chamber which is what we're seeing here so this you know so you can hardly you'd have to sort of use eye of faith to, to mm. trace that out um, and it was really important for this patient's ongoing management we wanted to try and you know establish essentially whether this man had um, coronary ischemia or whether he had um, a Takotsubo type pattern. Now, obviously, he needed an, a coronary angiogram for that, but we also wanted to get, um, you know, as accurate an echo as we could prior. And we also ended up doing a myocardial perfusion study um, as well. But what we did was give some contrast, so left ventricular pacification study. Um, and you can see how Beautiful. And we'll talk through contrast another time. There's, there's, it's definitely a talk in and of itself, and there's a few tips and tricks to know with yeah. that. But you can see instantly how. Can you see how these lovely? You've got that lovely tissue, tissue blood interface that you can see, and it's just so clear. And you can see these little trabeculations that are just popping out there, and a bit of the papillary muscle um, that you're just cutting through there. So they all want to be. You need to include all of these things within the LV cavity. Um, and this one's I love because it really has that octopus catcher, you know, that Takatsubo yeah. um, uh, look to it with the yeah. apical ballooning and the basal sparing. And it just it does have that shape of the octopus trap, which really came to light uh, beautifully when we gave contrast. And actually, 
this this could be left atrial um left atrial left anterior descending coronary um pathology couldn't it but the other big differential is is takatsubos which is what this patient ended up having yeah. um so they had a septic cardiomyopathy with yeah. a sort of takatsubo type and contrast was that, uh, gave you the ability to look for any apical thrombus as well and that apex is doing Nothing. Ab abs so. Absolutely, which is another reason Two that, we, that we that we gave it. Yes, yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. Because I was saying you can't see the apex very well, and whenever yeah. you see a hypokinetic or an akinetic apex, that's absolutely the thing that you should be looking for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So ejection fraction, something that we need to use in an outpatient setting. It's got good prognostic data in that population. Um, we need it definitely for measuring trends. Um, and it's and we need to be using it in a way because we have to speak the same language as everyone else. Yes. Right. So we have to yeah. be able to speak the same language as cardiology. And if we do, particularly if we're doing scans for cardiology um, and reporting scans for them, then we need to be speaking that language. But what about in the ICU population? I mean, this it's not quite as simple as that, is it? No, it's definitely not, and and which is why it's really important that we talk through some of this because, as we know, Chris, ejection fraction is load dependent, yeah, and that's that's really it in a nutshell. Mm. And we've got to understand the factors that are going to mask or, as you say, flatter the left ventricle, yeah, um, when really we've got a ventricle that 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 might be in you know its intrinsic contractility uh, might be impaired, and, and yeah. we often see that develop over time. Yeah. Um, so let's talk through. Yeah. Some and of and I guess I guess it's important to say that in in an outpatient setting with a patient who isn't acutely unwell, the with stable loading conditions, the ejection fraction is going to correlate with the systolic function, right? It's going to be re the ejection fraction is going to represent what their systolic performance is. Yes, absolutely, yeah. because they're going to be coupled and they're going to exactly. have concordance likely between their ejection fraction and their cardiac output. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Whereas in our population, ejection fraction is more representative of the um, ventricular arterial coupling more than the overall systolic performance. I think so. We've got some great examples to talk mm. to talk through this. Um, so in terms of, of loading factors that can, um, you know, alter alter that um, coupling or that, you know, concordance relationship between ejection fraction and cardiac output. Let's take a, a classic example. Maybe if we just come to this um, first, Chris, if that's all right. So a classic example, right, would be we talk, we've talk we talked about the patients on their cardiovascular journey mm. when they come through the ED and they, let's take a patient with septic shock, for example, yep. right? So we have a patient with septic shock who has a reduced systemic vascular resistance of very vasodilated. They're vasoplegic. All of their blood is pooling in their venous capacitant circulation. Yep. And they have a low preload state and a really low SVR, low LV afterload state. Yep. And with that, they've got loads of endogenous catecholamines going Ex circulating, exactly which is right. going to hit all of their beta receptors. They're yep. going to have so more sympathetic stimulation, more chronotropy, more inotropy. So you're going to take that um, day zero, that point in ED before they've had loads of resuscitation, before we started them on some vasopressors, and they're going to look like they've got a perfect or probably too good to be true ventricle. Exactly right. And that's that's a really key point and I, I think a, a real um, learning point from this for especially people just starting off with echo is that trends are everything. Mm. And, yeah. you know, and that's it just really shows why, you know, these patients they, um, you know, the, how, how low dependent that ejection fraction is. And as you said, ejection fraction does not equal systolic performance. No. And it's taking into consideration the whole heart um, and the loading conditions of yeah. the patient. So this, so this, um, uh, this, this made up patient who we've seen on pretty much every shift we've ever worked on is probably sat around here, aren't they? So they've probably got a supra normal EF and they may have a supranormal cardiac output, although actually if they're not resuscitated enough, they may be a little bit further toward, down there towards a slightly lower cardiac output state. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna give them loads of fluid. We're gonna give them uh, probably too much fluid. Then we're going to give them a load of vasopressors perhaps. So what's that gonna do? 
So when we give noradrenaline, obviously we're going to, you know, do that to in increase the SVR, right? Mm. We're also going to venoconstrict with that. So we're going to increase preload. We're going to increase afterload. And that LV that you previously saw in, in the ED, um, you know, after some time, and this is this is shown in, in the literature that's looked at all of this, um, that lovely paper on septic cardiomyopathy by Antoine yep. Viard-Baron, um, how we get this... Um, you know, this sort of cardiovascular journey, if you like, once we add in those agents, then, you know, we're going to start to see that that septic myocardium is going to then start to struggle, yeah. um, you know, a lot of the time. Um, now that we've corrected and slightly probably overcorrected the, the SVR using things like noradrenaline. Yeah. And these people who have a this supranormal ejection fraction, these might be the people who are going to end up with some kind of septic cardiomyopathy going down the road. So, then when we go and see them day two, day three, and they've, they're a little bit cool around the edges, their noradrenaline requirements are rising, everyone's scratching their head, their lactate's going off a little bit. Um, and these are the people that suddenly we're going to re-echo them, have another look, and suddenly their ejection fraction has gone way down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we are going to transition them from around here, and then they're going to probably initially go on a journey slightly further left, but they're going to slide further down towards this low EF and low cardiac output situation. And I guess it's important for what we do to say that you know, doing serial echoes allows us to titrate our cardiovascular support agents that we're doing. You know, at this point, if the norad's going up, they're on, I don't know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 of noradrenaline. You start some steroids. Mm -hmm. Are we going to add in some vasopressin? Are we going to start some inotropy, some some dobutamine, adrenaline, milonone, whatever your preference might be? Yeah. Um, you know, doing those serial echoes to see what part of their cardiovascular journey they're on is so important. We always need to contextualise, just as this graph is showing, ejection fraction with cardiac output. Absolutely. Otherwise, you know, ejection fraction without knowing what the cardiac output is, is is nothing to me. It, it, yeah. it means very little to me when I'm looking exactly. after critically young patients. Particularly as the, there are so many conditions where you, your ejection fraction can look perfect, but actually all the blood's going the wrong way. Exactly. And that's so part that's of the right. issues with not yeah. using colour Doppler when you're doing echo. Yes, yes. Yeah. And it it does start to get a little more in that advanced category. I just want to mention, Chris, sorry, just before we move on that, the, you know, in obviously in the outpatient cardiology setting, generally a higher ejection fraction is always a good thing. Mm. Um, but actually in our septic group, there is yeah. some data and it's not, it's relatively, you know, small studies and, um, but they do show that perhaps is this ejection fraction paradox and mm. perhaps the patients with, you know, the high ejection fractions in septic shock, um, you know, maybe, maybe they do worse than, than those with the sort of hibernating um, classic septic cardiomyopathy to, to sort of picture. And we certainly know that diastolic dysfunction is prognostic in, in septic cardiomyopathy. Yeah. I guess the key take home is that if you've got someone in septic shock who's got a high hyperdynamic ejection fraction, yeah. don't rest on your laurels. When you resuscitate them, when you start that NORAD, you need to be re-echoing them, especially if there's a clinical change or you know lactate trending up or things are deteriorating um, because it's very dynamic, this, this journey, yeah. as Chris was talking about, and they could fall into any one of these four boxes and you need to know, you know which one they're, yeah. they're trending in. And I guess, um, I guess this goes into some of the other bits and pieces um, that we see. Um, you know, if someone's got a supranormal ejection fraction and they're septic and they've got one of those mid-cavity gradients, um, you know, that's independently associated with a, with a poor outcome. So, you know, and that's something that only happens if you've got a very hyperdynamic heart. So. Yes, I think we've got a picture of that at the end, haven't we? Yeah. A similar one. So this is that paper that you were talking about as it's well. It's a lovely, it? yeah, it's yeah. not too long, but it just it really um, highlights some of those things we talked about. Yeah. So should we talk about a couple of the things that can make your systolic function look awesome? Yeah. That maybe um, your ejection are not fraction. Quite, yeah, sorry, your your ejection yes. fraction look really good that aren't quite so good for you. Yeah, so I think we've got a picture here. So for me, one of the classic ones, um, and we see this not infrequently no. in the ICU. We've had a, a few in the last month, actually, haven't we, where you have this um, patient that has, you know, so if you, again, it says this is the importance of using extra, um, you know, extra modes on in advanced echo with colour and, and, you know, thorough assessments. But we can see here that we have 
Um, this is a toe image. Mm -hmm. So it's a mid-esophageal four-chamber view. And the left ventricular systolic function looks cracking. It looks mm, like, you know, it's it hyperdynamic. Does. Too good. The ventricle walls look like there's an end systolic sort of obliteration almost, isn't there? And you would worry a little bit about whether there is any SAM and LVOT mm, obstruction yeah. if you yeah. slowed that down. Um, but the thing about this patient, Chris, is, and this really emphasizes the importance of coupling ejection fraction with cardiac output. Yeah. Their cardiac output was terrible. Yeah. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was it was very bad. Um, it's going the wrong way, isn't it? It's all, well, you might not be able to tell that just from this unless you're very astute and can see that, that structure flicking in the, the left atrium. And I think we all are guessing what this is now. This patient, um, unfortunately, had a, a ruptured pap muscle. Um, the antralateral, as it often is, with its, um, oh, sorry, the posterior, posterior medial. medial. I'm getting posterior. everything mixed up today. <laughs> the posterior medial, as it often is, because of its single uh, blood supply from the RCA. Um, so, yes, that was ripped off. She had uh, rip roaring, severe, acute mitral regurgitation. Yep. And this is a classic example of where you get that uncoupling, if you like, between ejection fraction and cardiac output. Yep. So, this patient would have you know, be in that box of high ejection fraction, mm -hmm. but low cardiac index and acute severe MR yeah. uh, for whatever reason, you yeah. know, um, is, a, is a really important yeah. cause of that. So we just put a bit of colour on there and you can see a horrific MR jet with super turbulent flow. So yeah. you know that this is a, a pretty a pretty bad case of MR. Yeah, so we'll talk. I, I look forward to our MR session. Yeah. Yeah. So what else have we got? So anything else that can cause you to have a low, a low cardiac output with a great stroke with a great um, ejection fraction? Yes. So um, what about this guy, I mean the the that LV function looks great. Maybe needs a bit of filling. I don't know. That is hyperdynamic. There's um, you know complete complete. Um, a collapse of that of that uh, end systolic cavity we're going yeah. to just give them volume and say and come back in four hours time like so i think just as we talked about with the in the in the podcast too with the lvot bi vti being mm. high you need to sort of explain that yeah and this is a hyperdynamic left ventricle and yeah. to me that that requires just as much explanation as a ventricle that looks like it's is struggling yeah um and, you know, so we, we think about things like any left to right shunt. So any any reason why there could be a low afterload state for that left ventricle. And that's either going to be because they're pumping blood back through into their left atrium or they're pumping it through a hole into the right side, which is a low, low resistance yeah. circulation. Yeah. Or they are extremely vasodilated in septic yeah. shock. You know, those are going yeah. to be the, th the three sort of main things. Um, this patient, it's all about clinical context, which is why, you know, for us, it's very much an extension of that clinical picture, their trends, um, repeating it all, and just having that index of suspicion. So this patient had had an MI three days prior yeah. um, and had this ischemic, um, you know, ischemic, Ventr ventricular septal defect um, and you can see blood um, going through that infraseptal infraseptal wall um, straight from the LV into the RV and hence LV going like the clappers but cardiac output down in their boots. We've only talked about really one intervention that we're doing I and mean, that's giving vasopressors um, and giving a bit of fluid but there are a huge amounts of things on the IC that we do be it um, putting a tube in and putting them on positive pressure ventilation, putting them on renal replacement therapy. There's a whole load of other stuff like extracorporeal support that are all going to play into it and cause a very dynamic nature to their heart. And we just need to be keeping an eye on them at every step of that journey and making sure that what we're doing isn't causing any harm. And then remembering as well, <coughs> oh, my throat went a little bit after. <laughs> remembering as well that... An ejection fraction that's normal in one country is not necessarily normal in another, is it? I know. I was pretty, I must admit, when I saw this, oh, good, I didn't realise it was um, quite as different as, as that there. I Yes, I mean, you're probably BSE, are you? I use the, the, the ASC cutoffs uh, for now. I yeah, know. well, I, I mean, I... I did all my um, accreditation with the old BSc, and now it's a new BSc, and now I'm oh. in, a, in a place that doesn't use BSc stuff. So, um, you know, I'm I'm all over the place. But this is just a good example of how of, of how actually, uh, if you have an ejection fraction of fifty percent, then that's normal in one country and is abnormal in another country. So yeah. it's it's just a good example of showing you that it's not not all about ejection fraction. It's not all about saying this is normal, this is mildly impaired, this is moderately impaired. It's about piecing everything together and um, trying to 
put that in context of everything else that's happening with your patient. And remembering that if you if you're not thinking about if you're not thinking about say what the cardiac output is, then you might then you might be led astray. You know, you could have someone w- with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of seventy five percent, yes, with basically no cardiac output, or you can have someone with dilated cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of five percent who's actually compensated for that and is leading to you having um, enough cardiac output to support whatever's going on. Yeah, absolutely. When it, that's really important. So with ejection fraction, it's coupling it with the cardiac output. And it's also putting that together with the loading conditions, which we've talked yeah. about. But it's also really considering the geometry of the left ventricle, which is exactly yeah. what you said. Um, and, you know, we have patients that have really badly dilated cardiomyopathies um, that come in with an ejection fraction of 10, 15 percent. But they're walking around talking to you. They are not shocked. That's yeah. because they've remodeled their end diastolic volume Huge. is huge yeah. and so their stroke volume ends up being enough to meet their metabolic requirements of their body yeah. um, but bring that patient critically ill to the ICU you know all of a sudden that's going to completely change because their metabolic demand has gone up and we can talk about this another time and probably their myocardial recruitability to be able it's to increase is, yeah. is, is not there um, and then also on the other end of that spectrum the importance of LV geometry with small left ventricular cavities yeah. classic would be you know elderly female with a big septic knuckle yeah. and um, they don't all have to have you know amyloid heart disease no. we see these um, type of patients come in all the time they've got you know big dilate they've got biatrial enlargement they've got small ventricles really tiny cavities big septal knuckles and you they get septic they get their urosepsis or something and before you know it their you know their ejection fraction is beautiful but they've got something that looks similar to this chris which we might show which is they can either d- develop um you know there's various points of obstruction so it can either be in the the apical region it can be mid cavity it can be at the lvot and they're all going to look, look different we'll have a whole session on that but this is um you know a patient who has got a preserved ejection fraction you might argue you know slightly hyperdynamic mm, yeah. um and you use uh, techniques such as doppler um and this one's pulse wave Doppler because you're looking to see where the gradient is. Yep. Um, and then they get this classic, you know, sort of late peaking um, profile, um, which in the mid cavity often looks like a stiletto heel. So it's, it's, it's quite different to what you get with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction where yep. you get that dagger shape um, and we'll talk through all this at another time and with mid cavity it tends to be very sharp uh, very late peaking and at a lower velocity than you would expect um, for an LV uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and it's often referred to as the stiletto heel and if you look for this you'll see this in a lot of our patients um, and you know often a bit of fluid and cutting back on the, uh, the catecholamines can actually be you know uh, what they what they need sometimes as well exactly so. want to give fluid to not dobutamine to exactly exactly yeah okay so i think we'll leave it there um we've talked a little bit about how to do ejection fraction some of the tips and tricks when maybe not to do it um making sure that you're coupling it with your cardiac output and a few times when um, maybe a really good ejection fraction is not quite that good enough for the patient yes no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to, I was just, yeah. just going to repeat what we'd already said because it's yeah. so important. So what are we doing next time? Oh, what are we doing next time? Oh yes. We're going to do some <laughs> cases, aren't we? We're going to do we some cases. We're yes. going to do some cases showing how to uh, bring all these measurements together. We're going to try and show you a journey of a patient and yeah. where all these have been integrated into that. Yeah. Um, I'm quite excited about that. Yeah. I think that'll, that'll yeah. be good. That'll be a, uh, uh, more um, it, entertaining thing to do yeah and I think it's also just it just it brings it to life because we are doing these things at the bedside where it matters the most please let us know if you um, have any recommendations on both topics you want us to cover uh, we've got a long way to go with this um, we're trying to streamline it as best as we can and we are you're streamlined I'm just some rogue <laughs> person here but... we're trying we're trying um, but any recommendations that you might have then um, then please please let us know we will listen and we will try and change it if, if we need to absolutely thank but you guys thanks very much and see you next time see you next time